Well, welcome, Louis Melmadrona. It's really good to finally meet you. I wanted to begin by asking you about the healing power of story. And how is it that you first became interested in how narrative can change a person's life? When I got to medical school, um, we had a, um, an experience where we could be an outpatient doctor for a year, half day a week, and I chose to do that. And they gave us an hour with each patient, and sometimes I would run out of things to do. And so I, I, would, I thought, well, what would my grandmother do if she had extra time on her hands? And so I started telling people stories. You know, if we had extra time, I would just say, oh, and, you know, that reminds me of a story. And I would tell a story. And, um, but, I, but I always knew that, I mean, I grew up in a culture in which stories were, people told stories to inspire you to instruct you, to help you to understand that you could be different, do different, uh, feel different, um, transcend, heal, all of those things. And um, I mean, honestly, it wasn't until I got to medical school that I came to realize that the dominant culture didn't do that. Hmm. You know, I, I was kind of oblivious of the dominant culture until I got to Stanford, where it rules. And, um, you know, I went to undergraduate at Indiana University, and I spent most of my time running um, all-night carbon-13 NMRs, you know, which is the precursor of MRIs. You know, we were, we were developing that technology. Mm. And so I was like a lab rat. And um, I had no idea what human beings did in the big world. <laughs> and um, though I minored in creative writing, so I wasn't a total lab rat. My major was biophysics, but my minor was creative writing. And um, so um, I just kept telling people stories. And one day someone asked me where I learned hypnosis. And I looked at them and I said, what's that? <laughs> So they said, that thing that you're doing. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, so that's called hypnosis. All right. So then I started studying hypnosis to see what I was doing. And I began to realize that there were, there were dominant culture derived people, though I wouldn't say they're completely in the mainstream, who were doing, who were telling stories also for healing purposes. And I think Milton Erickson, of course, is the most famous. And, but also um, many other people, even psychoanalysts, are telling, are, we're telling patients stories mm. to, to inspire them to get, you know, to change. And, um, and then I discovered that there was a whole narrative movement with Jerome Bruner and, and Theodore Sarban, and there was a European version of all this with um, Vygotsky and Bakhtin and Volosanov and um, other people like that. So, so then I, I actually got a master's degree in narrative studies, mm. you know, to just be more intellectual about the whole thing. Mm. And what goes into making a healing story? What are the components of a healing story? The person has to connect to the story. So it has to be, um, so the characters have to be similar to them or from their culture. Mm -hmm. So they have to feel that the characters are like them. And, and so they have to identify with the characters. And, and a good story leads people to believe that they can do what the characters did. Mm -hmm. that they can transcend, practice resilience, overcome obstacles, um, make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. just like the characters did. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of what we're doing in storytelling is building agency. Mm -hmm. Many people have no agency. They don't feel like they can do anything to make any difference in their world or for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, a heroic story, for example, teaches them that taking action in the world produces results. Mm. That if you do something, it will matter and you will feel better, get better. Uh, something positive will happen. And there's a marvelous study of uh, um, s southern uh, black people with h really high blood pressure. Mm. Listening to stories, well, watching videos of people like who look like them and sound like them uh, getting their blood pressure under control. Hmm. And so just listening to the stories caused them to get their blood pressure under control. Hmm. Hmm. And the guy who did the study repeated it in Vietnam, which I thought was really kind of cool. Hmm. You know, in, in tiny villages in northern Vietnam, uh, or in the north of Vietnam, as we should say, since there's not a North Vietnam. But, um, and, he, and he found the same thing. And again, what he did was to record people. He called them cultivating good storytellers. Mm -hmm. He recorded people who looked correct and sounded right and told, it, told uh, a compelling story. Compelling meaning, you've got my full attention. I really uh, connect with you. Um, and you know, I mean, to be honest, the literature is much better for novel writing about how to tell a good story than mm. it is in psychology or even narrative studies. So people who write novels have been struggling with this for a long time, longer than psychologists and narrativists or narratologists. And, and in fact, that's where I've turned nowadays to get my inspiration is to people who write novels and write about writing novels. There's a book um, that I'm reading right now. I, I, was, I thought I had it out, but I don't. It's called The Art of Time in Fiction. Oh, it's a wonderful. I, oh, you know that book. By, yeah. Sven, by Sven Berger. Silber, S-I-L-B-E-R. -E oh, there's another one. Called by Sven Burkert's with a very similar title about oh, okay. the art of time in memoir. I think it is. Okay, okay, I'll have to look for that. Yeah, or there's and another great book that I read was called Saves the Cat, hmm. and yeah, and it's a great book about creating compelling stories. And it turns out that the most important thing, according to these people, is a good character. Mm -hmm. And I believe that because. Um, you know, I'm, I'm slightly addicted to NCIS New Orleans. <laughs> and it's not because they have good plots. The plots are crappy. It's because of the characters. Mm, interesting. They're rich. Yeah. They're, they're complex. So creating a good therapeutic story is, is inspiring people to be more than they thought they could be. Mm -hmm. to do more than they thought they could do. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't really matter what the domain is. I think it's relevant, you know, in, coming from Indian country, we don't have that split between mind and body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, the same things that would help depression would theoretically help arthritis. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not different. Mm. Um, which is not like mainstream medicine. Right. So, um, so we need. To, so the goal is to inspire and to uplift, and um, to transform. Right. And and the interesting thing is that sometimes I'll tell someone a story and I won't have a clue why I picked it, mm. or I don't know what to do when I just pick the last story that I listen to and they come back the next week and they tell me oh that story it was so like powerful and they tell me what they got out of it so sometimes it people just need a seed to plant and it becomes their own tree mm. and, and and the storyteller gives them that mm, mm. What about the stories that we tell ourselves? I mean, is it possible to change our personal narrative to 
to help us heal and and wake up and become more whole oh absolutely but i i think the difficulty of mainstream culture is that we all want to do it alone in isolation mm. and within the indigenous world we recognize that healing takes place in community mm. so so i need to tell my stories to to others and i need to hear their stories in order to change and and the substitute for that is to write down my story so i can read it back to myself which is almost like having another person but not quite as good mm -hmm. and um yeah and one of the things that i love to do with people is to have them write about something in their lives in the third person with all the characters as animals mm -hmm. because it takes them away from their stuckedness in their situation by by turning everything into a metaphor and um you know and i love that six-part story exercise by yehudi um where you try and produce the story as far away in time and space as you possibly can. Hmm. So as to move it away from where you're stuck into a, into a metaphor that will show you how to get unstuck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and which reminds me, have you ever been to the Athens airport? The Athens airport? Yeah. Many years ago. Do you remember what the luggage carts are called? I don't. They're called metaphora. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In Greek, a metaphora is something that makes it easier to move things from one place to another. That's so interesting. That's that? yeah. 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 And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move things from one place to another. There's, there's another metaphor that I, there's a book that, um, a novel that I just love called Wild Dogs. Oh, Wild Dogs? Yeah, it's by Helen Humphreys. Hmm. And um, she, she talks, she links, she talks about a, this pack of wild dogs and her ex-partner let her dog run off and he got caught up in this pack of wild dogs who live at the edge of the city and she can't figure out how to get him back. Hmm. Like she goes to the edge of the city and every evening in twilight to try and get his attention and get him out of the pack, but nothing works. And so then she says, love is like those wild dogs. It hunts you down. And when it catches you, you never know if it will let you go or not. And, and so on and so forth. And it's just beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image. Mm -hmm. Is it, true to say that every life is a work of fiction oh absolutely Lauren barthas said that and i believe it to be true and and there's another quote and it might be from him as well that life is that fiction is truer than life mm -hmm. and or f fiction is the lie that tells the truth that's another way of doing that's it. that's another way of saying it yeah because we're always co-producing narratives with everyone we know. Mm -hmm. and, and I like to tell people that we're, we're all characters in each other's plays. Mm -hmm. And we're always being recruited for another play. And so we have to be careful whether or not to, to, to determine whether or not we want to play that role mm -hmm. in this other person's play. That it might be really good in Act One and Two, but but it might turn really bad in Act Three, like often happens for Shakespearean characters. Mm -hmm. So so, you know, become aware of the role that you're being asked to play in someone else's drama. Mm. And and your own. And your own, yeah. What is my drama? I mean, yeah. You know, I I love the. Um, Dan McAdams invented this live story interview at Northwestern University. And I, I love using that interview with everyone 
because it sets the stage for memoir writing. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need to write our autobiographies in order to understand what it is that we're up to. Mm -hmm. You know, in writing your autobiography, you become aware of what is the project of my life? Mm -hmm. what, what am I trying to do here? Mm -hmm. You know, and am I succeeding at it or am I failing or am I sort of on the mark? Am I off the mark? You know, mm -hmm. am I, what am I up to? The situation, though, the biography isn't really the story, is it? No. The, no. Story, is, the story is what the facts have meant to us and what we've done with them. Yeah, it's, it's, what, it's what exists between the facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what changes in a person, as, in your experience as a psychiatrist, when they realize that they are telling the story, they are the narrator, not the narrative, they're the storyteller, not the story, what changes in terms of personal agency? Well, they get some, is the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they start to think, well, if, if I'm the narrator, what do I really want to happen next? Where do, where do I want to be? You know, I love the writing the story of you five years in the future. Hmm. And I, I often have people write the most positive version, the most negative version, and the kind of average ho-hum version. Mm -hmm. So they can see the range of possibilities, you know, where you might be in five years. Mm -hmm. and, and when we do that, we have more capacity to get there, to get to where we want to go. Right. Because we become more mindful of where we want to go. You know, it's easier to get somewhere if you know where you're going. Mm. So, yeah, like, like having a map, so to speak. I'm interested, and this may get too wonky or may not be interesting. But I'm interested in how the brain actually uses narrative to affect behavior or to manifest reality. Okay, so this is something I'm totally into. Oh, good. Yeah, so, so there's this part of the brain or this circuit in the brain that's um, been called uh, default mode network, which is a, a really dumb name for it. And it was called that because back in the 70s when people started doing fMRIs of everything, because you could get tenure really quickly that way. And um, so they would have people do addition and they would, you know, the and they would have people do subtraction, multiplication, I mean, just you name it. And, and the control group was always, well, don't do anything. And so this, there was a fellow from the Netherlands who looked at the control group and he said, you know, when, when, you're not, when people are not doing anything, they're doing something mm -hmm. very similar to each other. And it wasn't until 2001 that Marcus Rakel at Washington University in St. Louis figured out that what they were doing was making up stories. And he said, you know what guys, default mode network is really story brain. It's the network, it's the brain circuit that we use to produce and understand stories. And then some other guys at University College London figured out, Turner was one of them, figured out that the main reason we make up stories is to manage our social relationships. Mm -hmm. And so they started calling it social brain, the circuit. Mm. So it's either default mode network, which sounds really dumb, or story brain, which I like, or um, social brain. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, we spend a lot of time in this circuit. You, running this circuit. It's what we do when we're not doing anything. We're making up stories about the important people in our lives. And often we're solving relationship problems. You know, we're running scenarios, running different stories about what would happen if I do X or Y or Z. You know, my, my favorite example is, have, you know, you, you have a fight with your uh, loved one in the morning. 
and you have to get to work, so you have to leave home unresolved. And so on the way home, what are you doing? You're making up stories about what you're going to say when you get home and how you're going to resolve this. Mm -hmm. And so, you, and you're, you're, you know, considering various strategies, you know, that you might perform on the way home, such as buying flowers, mm -hmm. buying chocolate, going to the bar and getting drunk, <laughs> you know, bringing, you know, bringing home Thai food. That's the way to my wife's heart, I will tell you that, is Thai food. Right, right. A good pad Thai and all <laughs> conflict is forgotten. <laughs> but in addition to social brain, isn't the story brain also existential brain in the sense that it's making sense of who we are in the world? What does our existence mm -hmm. mean? It's, mm -hmm. really, it's not just about other people. It's about how we yeah. navigate and negotiate being alive in a mysterious dimension. Exactly. And, and I, what I would add to that is that we never do that outside of the context of our relationships with other people. Hmm. You know, which is a difference between indigenous philosophy and, and European philosophy. That, so in, within indigenous philosophy, um, and I'm working on a PhD in that right now for fun, <laughs> just as an aside. Within indigenous philosophy, um, there is human beings can't exist outside of relationships with other human beings. Mm. That the self is found between our bodies. Mm -hmm. So the self is non-local. Mm -hmm. And so we're always making sense of existence in relationship to those around us. You know, embedded in a physical context. That, that's our world. You know, our human world, which is embedded in our natural world, which is embedded in a spiritual world. Mm -hmm. So we can't escape this sort of um, series of Russian dolls, you know, where one is in the next and the next and the next, that, that we can't get out of the center and be outside of, the, of our context. Mm. It's just not possible. Mm. So we're always trying to understand our meaning in the world, but it's always in relation to other people and to well, I would say to the natural world and the spiritual world as well. Is it possible to know ourselves without story? I don't think so. It's possible, I, I believe it's possible to have pure awareness that exists without story. Yeah. And that's what the Buddhists aspire to do. And I think it's a laudable goal. And I certainly attempt myself to meditate and to be um, thoughtless. I'm doing mindlessness meditation. Mm -hmm. However, the moment I come back to life, I need stories to just tell me what to do, how to orient myself. Like, mm. okay, so um, it's 1030 in the morning. Um, what am I going to do when we stop talking? You know, I need a story about what the day is supposed to look like in order to know what I'm going to do next. I'm also interested in the idea of story as interpretation of our existence. We have this extraordinary ability to believe what we make up. That's what I don't understand from a psychiatric, from a psychological point of view. How is it that we can talk ourselves into believing these stories? You know what I think it comes down to is comfort with uncertainty. Mm. And, and so some of us can sit here and say, I don't know what the fuck is going on. That's okay. I'm having a good day. <laughs> 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 you know, and the Buddhists call that radical acceptance, right? I mean, and, and, and I think people like the QAnon crowd. Mm, yeah, good example. Just, yeah. It just drives them nuts. I mean, it, it's, it feels psychotic for them to not know what's going on. Mm. And it's better to have a crazy story than it, you know, in which they belong, in which they have a place and a role 
in which they totally understand what's going on than to be in that situation where you say, I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, 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 some of us can tolerate more uncertainty than others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe some of us are more comfortably embedded than others. Mm. You know, so, so I feel like I'm comfortably embedded in my community. You know, I'm, I have my friends, you know, I have my children, um, I have my wife's family, you know, I have some colleagues that I really admire and, and hang out with, and I don't need QAnon to, ha- to have belonging. Mm. I have belonging. Mm. And, and um, so I think it comes down to uncertainty, sense of belonging, and sense of meaning and purpose. Mm. Mm. And so if you have no sense of belonging, no meaning or purpose, and you're not embedded in the community, well, QAnon looks really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or any other cult, for that matter, looks really good. So what that says to me is that narrative can be used for both positive and negative purposes, and, and that there's a, a, there's a real shadow side to this knee-jerk uh, impetus to create story, that, that, that it can really blind us as well as open us up to new possibilities. Absolutely. Stor- story is story. And, and it's, you know, there's, there's an amazing book by Goebbels, about the use of story in propaganda, mm. Mm. you know? And the Nazis understood story incredibly well. And, and Trump's people understand story incredibly well. I mean, they've got it down. And, and you know, it's really just about how the brain works. And people can manipulate the brain for evil or for good or in between right, right you know and and so that's the ethics of, of stories really is what is our intention mm. what are we trying to do are we trying to sell insurance because people use stories watch the tv i mean there's the guy the geico story of the lizard you know the gecko selling insurance i mean that's a story mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um and Liberty Mutual with the, with the emu. Um, so, you know, the stories are everywhere. And, and so are we, are we telling stories to get people to buy stuff? Right. Or are we telling stories to, to help people to live better lives, however they define that? Mm-hmm. You know, is our intention to serve ourselves or our company, or is it to serve the person who we're sitting with or the group whom we're sitting with. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that that is the ethical dimension of all of this. And on a personal level, we can ask ourselves, am I telling this story in order to feel like the victim? Am I telling this story in order to feel like the success story? Am I we we frame ourselves in roles within our own narratives. And, mm-hmm. and it seems to me that once we understand how we're doing that we can make more objective choices and, and, and kind of bust ourselves, the parts that yeah, are yeah. not authentic. I think so. I mean, I think we're always trying to save face to someone for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so we're um, telling ourselves stories that prevent us from feeling bad, you know, from feeling shame, especially, um, from from feeling guilty, from feeling um, that we did something wrong, you know, we're 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 always we're often telling ourselves stories to justify our actions. I imagine the guy who who killed George Floyd is telling himself a story that he was doing the right thing. Undoubtedly. Yeah, 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 and and among his social group, he probably was, but not the rest of us so as a psychiatrist if you met if you were speaking working with Chauvin the guy who 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 killed George Floyd how would you work with him to to question that narrative and come to 
a more sane and, and truthful position. Well, okay, so here's the problem. So as a psychiatrist, I would have to understand first his goal. Hmm. That might not be his goal. And so I might not be able to do that. I get, uh, his goal might not be to see the world like you and I see it. Right. His goal might be to stay ensconced in the way he sees the world. And I would have to respect that. Can you give me an example, uh, and you don't have to, if you want to change ident uh, identifying characteristics, can you give me an example of someone who you've worked with who has been able to change their personal story you know, it, to really reframe how they see themselves and their lives in a way that surprised you? Yes. One of my favorite stories that I like to tell is about a woman who came to me when I was practicing in Tucson, and she was hideously depressed. Mm. She was just so depressed that I felt depressed sitting with her. And so when, when that happens, um, I usually resort to one of my time-honored questions, which is, seen any good movies lately? <laughs> so I asked her that. And, and suddenly she, she brightened, like it was a transformation. And she said, whale rider. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you've seen that. Yes, of course. Oh, it's a lovely movie, yeah. And I'm like, really? And she's like, Yes, and I'm like, so tell me with whom you identify. And she said, well, obviously the main character. And I'm like, well, well like, how, you know, how, what is that all about? You know, and, and so she told me her story. I mean, she, um, so she was a nice Jewish girl in Brooklyn, and she fell in love with a cowboy from Tucson. Now that's a mistake right there, because if you listen to country music, you know, that can only go badly. But she didn't listen to enough country music. So she moved to Tucson, to his ranch, not knowing even how to drive. Hmm. Now, that's crazy in hmm. Tucson, because the public transportation sucks. So um, there she was stuck on his ranch with nothing to do and he's, he's decided that he doesn't love her anymore. Hmm. Now that is sad. And so I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this one? And I said, all right, well, do you like, you know, you like that character. I, I forget blocking on her name right now. but um, I said, so how, how, what can we do what could we do now, right now, in this moment or, you know, series of moments for you to feel more like her and less like how you feel right now? And she said, stick fighting. I could learn stick fighting. And you remember that scene where, where the character bribes her brother with beer to teach her stick fighting. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then she defeats the pupils of her grandfather, you know, which really annoys him. And so I'm like, okay, stick fighting. So, so, um, so we look for a stick fighting teacher in Tucson. And we found one. And he was a Filipino guy, you know. He wasn't Maori, but, you know, maybe one stick is as good as another stick. And so I called him up with her right there in the office, and amazingly, he answered the phone. And I said, hey, I've got someone here who wants to learn stick fighting. Will you teach her? And he said, her? And I said, yeah, her. And he said, I've never taught a girl. And I said, well, any problems with that? And he said, I guess not. He said, why not? <laughs> you know? And so, so I put her on the phone with him. And they connected, you know. And... And over the course of a few months, she totally transformed. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and so, and I had very what, much... What changed in her? How did she change? She became confident. She became self-assured. Mm. You know, she, she developed agency. She learned how to drive. 
She moved into town. Wow. And I said, you're so different. I said, ah, ah, what happened? And she said, well, you know, I'm not afraid anymore. I said, why? She said, well, if anyone threatens me, I can kill them. <laughs> and she said, besides, I have so many dates, you can't believe it. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, there's only men in my stick fighting classes. And they're all, <laughs> yeah. She said, they're all soldiers from the Air Force Base or, you know, um, policemen. And she said, apparently they like girls who can beat them up. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. great. So by identifying with a character, you know, mm -hmm. she was able to transcend her victim story. Yes. Yes. And exactly. step into step into some power. Exactly. Wow. wow. Yeah. Just one last question. I want to ask you about the spiritual uses of story. And of course, from the native tradition, they're inseparable, I think, with the narratives you tell for you know around day to day life, but what distinguishes a spiritual story that heals and, and can unify? Well, I mean, I think it's it's just a story that includes sacred beings as mm -hmm. opposed to ordinary beings, because I think any story has the potential to heal and unify, and so you know, really, the spiritual stories. I think are about orienting us to our place in the universe. And, and most of the Native American stories teach, that, teach us to be humble, to realize that we're a pretty insignificant part of the universe, mm -hmm. and that we're interdependent and interconnected with all beings. Mm -hmm. And um, here's there's a, a guy in um, Nova Scotia who created this concept of two-eyed seeing, mm. which is to see the world with both indigenous perspective and, and conventional scientific perspective. And, and there's, um, there's, within that, there's a word in Mi'kmaq, Metulimkik, or something, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but it means that we're all interconnected, interdependent, and interrelated. Mm. And to me, that's a spiritual story. Mm. It's a story that teaches that. And, and it's the meaning of, you know, in Lakota, which is my father's tribe, um, there's, we say, mutakwiyasin, which means that we're all related. We're all relatives. So, and, and not just humans, but everything. We're all, everything is a relative. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's a spiritual story, you know, which is really system science, you know, if you think of it, or ecology as well. It's the story that we're, we're all interdependent, interconnected, and interrelated. And to me, those are the most powerful, profound spiritual stories mm -hmm. because they guide our behavior. Mm -hmm. So, so... Whatever I do, I have to think about its effect on everything, mm -hmm. on, on all beings, mm. and and not just you know human beings, but water beings and and raccoons and everything, you know that I can't, I can't, that it's unethical to be selfish, mm -hmm. to think about and to think that it's all about me. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that seems to me medicine for the for what ails us, you know, in an alienated, fragmented, secular culture where we don't uh, feel a lot of connection with others often or to the environment. That seems to me that exact that's the perfect antidote to, to the disease that we have. And that's what Albert Marshall, who invented this idea of two eyed seeing, says. He says we need these ideas to survive as humans. Otherwise, we'll disappear, and some other mantle will take over. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much. It's so good to meet you. I appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us today. Well, thank you. It was fun.